Marilyn, some of my philosopher friends would argue that consciousness, as strong as we feel this inner subjectivity, is really an illusion. Speaking as a social anthropologist, someone who studied ESP, how do you reflect on the reality of consciousness? I think that since the time of Descartes, we struck a political deal that the body belonged in one domain of science and the soul or the spirit or consciousness belonged to the religious studies and that those two shouldn't be um, entangled. And I think we're still living in the legacy of this kind of emphasis on the material aspects of reality as the only valid form of reality. So when you start looking at the nature of our inner experience, it's that part which makes us feel most alive. Why would we, simply because of this political deal struck at the time of the Middle Ages, try to denigrate the nature of our inner awareness, our inner experience? Uh, rather, I think that it's time for science to reconcile its relationship with the nature of consciousness, with the nature of our inner life, and to see that by bringing science and this kind of physicalist orientation together with the insights of the wisdom traditions and the spiritual traditions, I think we have the potential of a breakthrough in our understanding of who we are and what we're capable of becoming. That sounds very nice, very syncretic, very um, um, uh, per, uh, uh, harmony, creating nice harmony, but some would say, and I'm not sure I disagree, that it, it just violates the, the, the reality that those conscious feelings that you think you have and I think I have are just a product of different systems in the brain that are working together and giving us uh, an illusion of something that is, is not really there. And we should grow out of the archaic way of thinking and mature into a, a true understanding of what our physical reality is all about. Well, I would argue that the archaic view is the one that separates them, that assumes that we are nothing more than the physical aspects of our being. Uh, you think about something like culture. As an anthropologist, you see that uh, what we experience as consciousness can be collectively constructed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in this intersubjective space between sure, us. Sure. And that's very real. Um, and so that's one sort of take on it. The notion that our consciousness is, is embedded within our brain is also a very real take on it. Um, but I think that as you begin to think about what motivates and inspires, what is the nature of creativity or inspiration or love or these kinds of qualities of our humanness, uh, if you want to just denigrate all of that to its physicality, I think you've lost the potentials of what it means to be fully human. I don't think that anybody's denigrating it's just saying how it's constructed, that, uh, that the physical brain systems of emotion, the limbic system, you, you can show, you can show in functional nuclear magnetic resonance and what lights up when you look at un, uh, pictures of, of, uh, of uh, danger or of compassion or mercy, I mean, different aspects, you can see how it's happening. So it's not an attempt to denigrate, it's an attempt to, to properly analyze where these things come from and you can see it. I'm a big fan of the neurosciences and the idea of really looking at the ways in which so much of our behavior and our um, inclinations are unconscious, that we really don't have an awareness of that. And so, so much of that is hardwired into the brain. And yet when I look at the data from something like parapsychology, where it appears that somehow our consciousness is more than just located in the brain, but somehow has this capacity to reach out, to extend into the world, that implies that there is something more than just the physicality of consciousness Consciousness as a reduction to the brain, and more that consciousness may be something that interconnects each of us in ways that are actually measurable. I would have to say that if parapsychology is in any way real, that that is perhaps the strongest argument for the independent existence of consciousness. I think that is an entirely legitimate point. Uh, I remain skeptical as to its ultimate so-called ontological reality. Uh, but if it's true, which is why uh, even skeptically I support very strongly the work that you and your colleagues do, because even if there's a chance that it's right, we as human beings need to know it. I think there's a danger in our culture where we 
kind of steamroll over anything that's qualitative, anything that, that feels soft. Um, and yet it's the part that is most meaningful to us. It's the, the part that gives us sort of that sense of purpose and telos in life. Well, that's why it can fool us. And that's why I'm nervous, because you, you, you feel it so much and you want it to be right, and it feels like the real you is all the more reason that you should be very skeptical about it and very suspicious about it and very cautious about it. Well, I think that it assumes that one ontology is supreme over another. And rather than thinking that it's just all material or it's just all phenomenal, you know, perhaps there is a way in which as we, you know, engage in 21st century living, as we look at all the different worldviews that coexist simultaneously, perhaps it's more about a both and than an either or. And that as we begin to look at the data from Psy Research, for example, where um, it appears that one person can describe the content of another person's experience, this suggests that our consciousness can reach out and that, in fact, our subjectivity is entangled with the material aspects of our experience, but may also be something that, that extends beyond.